Nummer. Okay, great. This is the Empower Performance for Curlers podcast. My name is Stephanie Thompson and I am your host. And today's episode is a monthly question and answer. So all month long, I've been kind of compiling a whole big list of questions that I'm going to answer kind of rapid fire and more like Cole's notes version. And then of course, if I take anything from that and want to actually make a longer episode than I might in the future as well. So it's a little bit of inspiration as well, but it also helps me answer questions a little bit faster than, uh, than I might normally get to and give people who like email in a question, make sure I give those people a little bit more than what they want. Um, then aside from just like a two sentence answer, because I don't really have that much time to just answer those emails. But once a month, I have time to put down this monthly question and answer. Part two is when we're going to do a case study. And I've got a very wonderful person all the way uh, from Scotland who has uh, volunteered their videos for us to do an analysis of. And this case study, which I'll explain a little bit better when we get to that, that'll be the second half. The case study purpose is so that I, kind of, I, st I want to start to put together kind of a, a, a group of people that maybe at some point high-end athletes, high-end coaches, wannabe coaches, sit down, analyze some things, go through how we might coach someone in certain scenarios. So I feel like this is really valuable in the movement space. I've been a part of a few different types of case studies before in the movement space, the rehab and the fitness space. And I think this is something that Curly really needs. So this is going to give us a chance to, at least it'll be me going through how I might analyze someone in this case's sweeping technique, what I might do with them in a practice. And that should hopefully give you some things that you might do with yourself, or you might even do if you're a coach with one of your athletes. So question and answer to start, case study afterwards. Uh, you have the opportunity to just listen to this episode. It is up on the Empower Performance for Curlers podcast, which is on Spotify and pretty much every place that you could ever get a podcast to be. And of course, if you're listening to this and you're like, whoa, is there a chance for me to watch this episode? Watch Steph talk with her hands. Link is asleep down here on the floor because he thinks food is going to happen, even though he's uh, 57 minutes until his dinner time. So he's being very patient. Um, then you get a chance to go onto YouTube and check out my YouTube channel and make sure I link it in the show notes for you. Now, this was obviously supposed to be released at the beginning of the month. And I ended up getting a cold that had me lose my voice. Like I literally was just like a squeaky little mouse. So there was absolutely no way I could record a podcast that, uh, on that day. So bear with me. I've got the back end of the cold. I definitely don't think I'm in like the contagious stage, stage anymore. You can kind of hear me breathing, which I always find triggering when I'm the person listening. So I apologize. Hopefully I don't have any coughing fits, etc. And of course I'm going to be drinking some tea because that's what I do. So let's get with that question and answer. Um, make sure that anything I mentioned will be linked in the show notes. If I forget it, don't hesitate to send an email out. And of course, if you've got a question for next month or want to volunteer as a case study, please send me an email or in the show notes, you're going to see where you can um, anonymously submit your question or your potential case study. So let's get to it. Our first question, and of course I'm reading these because they're long, which is lovely. Recovering from knee surgery that is taking longer than expected. I, I want to return to curling as soon as I can, but I don't want to rush the process because re-injury is a major concern for me. My questions would be, what parameters do you suggest for people to return to curling? And what things can I work on to get me there faster and increase my confidence when I return to the ice? And these things go hand in hand. It's like, we want to get back to curling ASAP. We're afraid of injury. What kind of things can I do to make sure I'm in a really good space that I'm confident and I feel ready and I'm not setting myself up for re-injury? Because that's, you've done that. You've been injured. You hated it. You don't want that to happen again. So I love where this person's coming from. To be honest, this is someone that actually ended up helping out in a, in a virtual assessment. So if this sounds like something that you need help with, I have assessments that I can put you through virtually in person, give you the tools to help get you on your way. So these are just general parameters, but a couple of the things that uh, I would give someone, so like generally you have an injury, you wanna get back to curling, what kind of things might you want to make sure you can do off the ice in order to make sure things on the ice are gonna feel good. So one of them, is to be able to squat. So if you're like, my knee hurts, my back hurts, my ankle hurts, what have you, and it hurts to squat, you experience pain in a squat. You experience pain 
in a deadlift, anything that kind of mimics your getting into the hack. If you have pain off the ice doing that, you're likely gonna experience pain on the ice. So that's an area that I would be focusing on in the gym with your rehab, with your trainer, uh, or of course, reaching out and I can give you some help with that as well. In order to get into a good squat or a hinge, that allows that means we have to have really good rib cage mechanics, core mechanics, hip mobility, ankle mobility. So not being able to squat or not being able to hinge is 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 a good recommend um, a good representation of the health of your upper body. The other thing that I want you to be able to do, okay, you can squat, you can hinge, but could you confidently get into a reverse lunge? Step back with one leg, step up. Step back with one leg, come up. Can you get into the curling slide? Can you get into exercises like the split squat? Are you comfortable with doing a step up? If you do those things off the ice and you feel comfortable, you can jump, okay? You could do a long jump, you could hop on the spot. Those things feel good. You likely are gonna feel okay while you're on the ice. So again, just using them as metrics. They're not, you know, these aren't high intensity, big complicated assessments that your physio is like, oh, can your leg do this? It's like, can you squat? Can you lunge? Can you stand up? Can you jump? If those things don't hurt, you're likely in a good space to go curling. Okay, and uh, in terms of the lower body, again, because this person was talking about their knee surgery, can you laterally lunge? Could you step sideways and sweep? Could you laterally shuffle down the ice or maybe you sweep in kind of a jogging motion? Can you do those pieces? Again, you can do those things off the ice, then you're likely to be in a really good place when you step back on the ice. And these sound so obvious and that's perfect. I want it to be obvious. I don't want it to be this big complicated, if you can't do this, then you shouldn't go curling because most people that are watching this, you're not, you're not trainers, you're not physios, okay? So these are your own little metrics. Now, that being said, if you get stuck with one of those things, now you know, okay, if I get into a split squat and I actually feel it in the back leg, okay, my right leg, my trail leg, and I feel that, I'm like, oh, I don't know if that feels good. Now I know what I'm going to work on with my trainer. Is it the glute? Is it a hip thing? Is it an endurance thing? Am I missing out? in terms of an alignment piece. What kind of things can I start to do off the ice to get myself into a more confidence place? And the interesting thing about the, the gap between rehab and performance is that you go to your physio, right? And they're like, okay, your knee surgery went well, your knee is healed, things are looking good, you can go curling now. And you're like, uh, okay, like you're a little tentative. Maybe you actually got hurt while curling. Maybe you need to bring yourself back a little bit slower because you're afraid of re-injury. So it's not just is that, let's say you tore your ACL and we've strengthened the eight, they, they, they've sutured it back up and they've strengthened it and they're like, yep, everything's good. But what about the hips? What about the ankles? Hey, what about your core? What about your ability to go side to side? What about your ability to jump and land? Okay, so we're looking at movement options, making sure we're accessing the movement options that we need for curling. Okay, beautiful. Uh, that's question number one. Hope that's nice and simple. If you need help with any of those things, don't hesitate to reach out. I do movement rehab virtually. And if you're in Ontario, I do have opportunities for you to work with a physio and be able to work with your insurance, work with me through your insurance and through that physio. So don't hesitate to reach out because I'd love to help. Next question. Someone pointed out that they said, why do I get so triggered? So, sorry, they didn't ask why did they get so triggered. I added that on. They said, I hate it when people said, say, don't hate it. And I was like, I wonder why you don't, why you get triggered when you do that. Um, so because this is more of like a mental performance side of thing, I reached out to a friend of mine and a competitor, Emily Riley. She's been on the podcast a bunch. So check out her episodes. And I asked her, I was like, why would someone say, don't hate it? So let's give you a scenario because this person didn't give me a scenario. Let's give it a scenario that, I'm the skip and I'm giving options to my second and my, I say, do you like the shot? And my second goes, I don't hate it. And I'm triggered because it's not really helpful. And Emily agrees. She's like, it's not the most helpful piece of information, but I do think take a little step to the side here. There's some context involved. If that's something that you and your team say as a thing, and it's either funny to you, it brings a light moment to the scenario. Maybe you're like, oh, right. Like everything's a Hail Mary. So you're like, don't hate it then that's fine. Like if it's got a place for you in your 
uh, curling world in your curling space and on your team and it feels productive, you're going to keep it. It's, it's just a word. It's just sentences. It doesn't mean anything. But if you're the type of person that's always like, you know what? I don't really like this shot. So instead of saying I don't like it, I'm just going to say I don't hate it. And you're just not going to like beat around the bush. Um, then what Emily points out, because she's a mental performance consultant, is that it's not as helpful a statement. So if your skip gets triggered by this language, the conversation you would want to be having is, what do I want to hear instead? What kind of things are helpful in that situation? So it's not necessarily never say that again. It's like, can we be a little bit more specific uh, and provide a little bit more precise language? Because language is really important to pay attention to, and it can strongly influence our emotions and our dynamics. And, and that's why I, on one hand, if it's funny to you and it's a good part of your, you know, your own team camaraderie and that's, it, it fits on your team, you're going to keep it. But if you're on a team and you're like, I really don't like when people say, don't hate it, then maybe we need to have a conversation as a team to make sure we're using precise language in a way that's going to be really helpful for everyone. On the flip side, because I could relate to that, that doesn't really bug me, but it's always bugged me as a sweeper, right? I love sweeping. I love being front end. Always hate it when someone yells down, all you. Just makes me want to like, strangle them because it's not helpful and I didn't really realize that so thank you Emily for pointing out why that might be is it wasn't a helpful piece of information I understand if you're on a team and the skip says all you and everybody understands that that actually means line is good then you're in a great space whoever you are out there yelling that can keep on doing that but I know that if my skip all of a sudden said all you I'd be like ah I don't want it to be all me. It's a team. You get to, you throw the rock. You tell me what you think. I'm going to sweep it. I'm going to judge. I'm going to communicate. You're going to tell me about the line and all those different things. So the, 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 the message here is that we're trying to have really precise language and have really helpful conversation amongst your team, whatever that looks like. So if it includes things like all you and don't hate it, then great. Okay. The, the key is that, that the teams are having those conversations, which I think is wonderful. Next, just wondering if you have any advice on preparing off the ice for a curling mixed doubles tournament that I have this weekend. Outside of curling practices, how would you recommend preparing physically and mentally to play four, possibly six games? And I am so sorry, but the week before is not the time to prepare for your mixed doubles tournament. But let's say you're in a scenario where you're being asked to spare for someone last minute. You haven't really been preparing for mixed doubles. I would be personally prioritizing rest, making sure my body is in a really good physical state, my mind is in a really good physical state, that I've organized my weekend appropriately, I've got food lined up, transportation, where am I going to sleep, when am I going to sleep, all those different things to make sure that I'm organized for that week. So in terms of preparing for the weekend, for me, it's making sure that all those little things have been taken care of so that when I show up, I can be an awesome teammate and I can go curl. Now, if you're thinking how... Can I suddenly become a mixed doubles player? Maybe your practices are going to be a little bit more focused around drawing behind that center guard. Maybe it's about being able to throw differing weights between T-line, back line, guards. Maybe you're a team and you've discussed this with your, your new doubles partner that you're going to be a run back team. So talking about run backs. Maybe you want to watch a couple games together or watch a couple games and take some notes and make sure you talk about those scenarios. What's the tolerance on the first shot in the first end? Do you want to have hammer coming home? When are you going to take your power play? All those little things are going to come into play. And with that last second uh, ask to go curl, which I'm assuming, um, I, I hope that you have the chance to both take care of yourself, plan ahead, and then maybe do a little bit of research into doubles. That's basically all you can do. And if you've curled before, Doubles and four person, very similar game, closest to the button. That's all you're looking for. So just for recognizing that, understanding the rules are a little bit different in the style of play and coming up with little different things that you and that partner are going to do. Next, the question is, I am a club curler. Do you have any recommendations on what elements need to be covered? Hold on, this happens every single time. I panic. But I'm not recording and I'm recording. Okay, let's start that over. <laughs> so sorry. I'm a club curler. Do you have any recommendations on what elements need to be covered in an end of season or wrap up meeting, especially if the season didn't go well? And here's the thing 
and I've, I've battled this for the last 10 plus years is that in my brain, the level that you compete at, whether it's a learn to curl league club competition, uh, you're playing in silver taker, you're playing in university stuff, or you're playing on the tour, uh, you're playing in the slams, you're trying to play down for the Olympics. A lot of the elements are the same. A lot of the things are the same, but to differing levels. So especially when it comes to your body, like if someone's like, oh, what's the difference between the training for a club curler and a competitive curler? Largely the same. There's differences. Competitive curlers preparing to hopefully play like seven, eight plus games in a week. They are likely going to play 10 in games. Like it's going to look a little bit different than your club curler. However, club curlers curl a lot. They play a lot. So that training isn't too, too different. Everybody needs to get in the hack. Everybody needs to slide. Everybody needs to sweep. Everybody needs to be mentally tough. There's interesting parallels there. And I understand the importance of pointing out I am a club curler. I am a competitive curler, uh, especially for this, because you're right. It's not the same. I'm not trying to you know, make it to the Olympics and put in the effort that's going to you know, take over half of my life. Uh, but I do just like to kind of point out that dichotomy that really a lot of the things are the same. So what I would put into a... Uh, kind of end of season wrap up. Uh, here's a little thing. Okay, lots of different directions that we can take. Number one, if you made goals last year, I would review those goals uh, at the end of the year. Okay, did you achieve the goals that you set out? And did you do the things if you had set out a process, number of times a week you're gonna practice, work out, how many games you're gonna play, when are you gonna have team meetings, all that kind of stuff. Did you do the things that you said you were going to do that were going to help you accomplish those goals? Did you follow it? Did you achieve it? So a little bit of reviewing of the goal setting that you had before. Now, if you didn't do any goal setting last year, maybe you want to set some goals for next year. So after this little bit of reflection that we do, you can start to think, I want to accomplish X next year because training for next year starts today. Okay, it starts today. If you've got issues with balance, mobility, knee pain, back pain, endurance, that stuff you can work on in the off season, which is brilliant. Obviously, I'm going to say that. Uh, okay, next. Um, stop light activity. Stop light activity. Oh, not stop light activity. Stop light activity. So you know how the stop light has red, yellow, and green. Okay, so we've got red is stop, yellow is proceed with caution, and green is go. Thinking of it like that, for the red light, what kind of things did you and your team do that you want to stop doing? Okay, and take that however you'd like. Okay, thinking outcome, thinking process. What kind of things are you going to keep doing? Green, keep doing. And what kind of things, yellow, are you going to start to do? So what kind of things are do you want to stop doing? What kind of things are you going to keep doing that were really productive, we really liked it? And what kind of things should we start doing? Okay, so that I find that activity really helpful for any level of player in, of course, differing contexts. Also, what kind of things worked last year and what didn't? So really sit down and it's not just all about these. We had a bad year. These are all the way, things that didn't work. What kind of things did work? Because if absolutely nothing worked, you probably shouldn't play with that team next year. Right? Like if absolutely nothing clicked, you probably clicked. You probably aren't in a space that, yeah, you, let's keep going. Normally, the teams that want to stick together are like, okay, these eight things were working and we're on the right, right spot. These five things aren't working. We're going to either eliminate them or work on improving them for future. Uh, again, what kind of goals are we going to set for next year? So we can use the stoplight activity, what worked and what didn't, and reviewing our goals to identify some things that maybe we want to we wanna build on for next year. That being said, I like to go into these conversations, beginning of the conversation with a for the team attitude. And my advice, in my experience, it can be most productive if we focus on trends in performance and process and habits, not by pinpointing that one time you said the one thing and it really pissed me off because we can get really defensive. And especially at the end of the year, there's nothing else that we can do except for move forward. So with a for the team attitude, focusing on trends, we can start to say these trends, these things weren't working. And I noticed that when we didn't warm up as a team, when we rolled in late, then we typically gave up a bunch of points in the first end. 
Okay, so next year, we're instead of uh, showing up late, we're all going to prioritize being there 15 minutes early so that we have a time to put our shoes on, um, etc. So looking for little things instead of, I always hate when you say this after a shot, looking for the trends where even just pointing out, like, I really loved it when you did this. Can I get more of this? This isn't helpful. This is helpful. And going from there. So hopefully those tips are helpful. Really simple. Honestly, keep it really, really simple. That's my re recommendation. Hey, this is a broad question. And honestly, probably not appropriate for this little Q&A. So I'm likely going to pinpoint it as like a, an episode for in the future. The question is, what is the best off-season knee rehab, exercise routine, and frequency? So really simple answer. Depends on the problem. <laughs> Depends on what's wrong. Your knee hurts, but why does your knee hurt? Okay, is it a hip issue? Is it a uh, timing issue? Okay, are we overusing that knee? Is it something going on with the ankle? Is the other side not keeping up? It really kind of depends on why your knee hurts. Yes, Lincoln, we see you. I love you. Food is coming, okay? Um, so it depends on the problem. I like to look at your movement options. And honestly, I'm a big believer in daily routines, okay? You've got an injury. You've got a movement inefficiency somewhere in the chain. We need to be putting some, it, some focus on that every single day. That's my opinion. And what I notice works best. Those that only do knee rehab twice a week, three times a week, takes way longer because often we're trying to we're trying to override compensation patterns uh, and if you know 70% of the week you're doing what you normally do and the th rest of the time the 30% of the week is when you're trying to override it's really hard to move better and get things better so honestly something every single day it doesn't have to be a massive routine Often what I end up giving people is a daily routine. Okay, here's one or two different daily routines. They take about 10 to 15 minutes. Do it any time of day, repeat it twice a day if you really want to. And then there's typically a one or two um, routine. You know, this I want you to try to accomplish this three or four times a week. And that way you have something that you can do every single day and dedicate to that knee rehab. And you've got a little bit of a more in intensive program that will help to push that needle a little bit further. So again, really depends. Hopefully that general answer is helpful for you. Any advice for arena curlers who can't play more than once a week? And this advice isn't just for arena curlers, it's for anybody who can only play once a week for whatever reason. And I actually have worked with people who they only have access to ice about once a month and they do little training camps. So we're watching film, working on our mental performance. We're doing our physical training. And we're really maximizing physical training because we can't get on the ice. We're visualizing our sweeping, our releases. We're talking with our teams. And then we can do things like that are dry land based for. So, for example, you might have seen on my page dry land brushing. So either just getting into the dry land brushing plank, okay, holding that position or actually sweeping on the spot and doing intervals with that. And then you can also practice your delivery off the ice with what I call like a dry land delivery, where you're trying to get into the hack, pull up and back, rock foot forward, and then kick. Okay, so really working on that timing, working on that positioning and gaining your comfort. Um, other than that, when you are on the ice, I'd be really, really trying to take advantage of the time that I have and prioritizing and protecting that time. So if I'm only on the ice once a week, I'm going to have a really good warm-up. I'm going to have really good goals for that session. And I'm going to do, do a good little bit of uh, reflection after the game on what went well and what I need to work on for the rest of the week. All right, what do we got here? Okay, I'm on year three of curling, and I still fall over a couple times a game. Any exercises that'll help. So many different exercises that can help. I just can't pick point one, especially because this is a very broad question. I don't know why this person is falling over. In general... What I'm seeing, if people are struggling with balance and getting the foot in the right spot, it's two things, sometimes separate and often together. Number one, number one is if our timing is off. So this person pulls back and then when they go forward, the rock and the slider foot typically go together, which means we don't have time to get that foot underneath us in a comfortable position. 
Our body's not in the right spot, which means as we're sliding, we're trying to find balance. So the timing is typically off in people who fall over in what I've seen. So either our timing is like mismatched and or our timing is kind of just everything going forward at the same time instead of giving yourself a bit of a delay. So I'm going to demonstrate on the video here. So if you're in uh, the hack and you pull up and back, however you do that, what most coaches are recommending and what you're going to see with a lot of the high-end curlers is that the Roth and the broom go forward, leaving a little space between your back foot and the Roth before the slider foot has moved. Okay? The reason that's helpful is now I can put the slider foot under exactly where I want it to be and then kick out of the hack. So it's not back and forward all at the same time and trying to figure out as you're sliding. It's up and back, rock, foot, kick. And that gives us a better chance that we're gonna get that foot in the right spot. So timing, typically off. And the second thing, which can be done in conjunction or separately, maybe you've got the timing, is that a lot of people with balance issues who fall, they just look like they're rushing the whole slide. Just the whole slide is just, I gotta get back, I gotta get forward, I need to get down there. People told me how I had to be quick. And I understand that feeling and because I feel like, especially in my golf, my golf game, I was always rushing. It was like, oh my God, I'm not a very good golfer, so I need to hit as fast as I can. And guess what, I hit, had to hit more shots, which in golf, that's not good. It's not good to hit lots of shots. Whereas if I took my time in my setup, took a breath, didn't rush, that timing, I was able to hit better shots, less shots, and therefore I took less time up. So for a lot of curlers, what I'm noticing is they're getting in the hack, they get back, and then they just need to get forward. They're like, I need to make the shot. And we're rushing and everything is just kind of pushed forward. It influences our timing and it influences how confident we can get that foot down. Now watch, the best players in the world, yes, they move quickly and precisely, but they're not rushing. So there's a difference between moving quickly and being powerful and rushing our way through the movement. So I encourage you, if you're someone who typically falls a couple times a year, a couple times a game, take a breath, take a moment. Okay? Even in your slide, maybe you get down the half, take a breath, pull up and back, take a breath, and then take yourself forward with that good timing. That would be my recommendation is that you're likely rushing it. And so many curlers rush it at all levels and it, it messes up a whole whack tons of things for us. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Any good advice for junior curling, especially during the off ice season? So for off ice fitness, I have loads of resources for junior curling, for adult curling, people new to curling, people preparing for the Olympics, what have you in terms of off ice fitness. And I'm just gonna tell you to go to my website. I'm gonna tell you to go to my YouTube and tell you to go to my Instagram. And of course I'm gonna put it in my show notes, but we've got an off season menu with what I believe are really affordable programs that you and your team can purchase and follow along on. Now, if you're like, I want it to be free because everybody loves free stuff. A couple of years ago, I got a grant from Curling Canada and I feel very fortunate to have gotten that grant. And I made a program for young women in curling. And the purpose was to provide off-season training that was free. Here's the thing. I made the program for young women in curling because I want to make sure we keep women in the game that anybody could use this program, <laughs> anybody. So uh, junior curlers, adult curlers, anybody can go to this program. So I'm gonna link it down below. The Young Women in Curling, the Empowered Performance Young Women in Curling Project, I think it's called. And I've got three little workouts that you can follow along on that are going to give you a really good head start on the types of things that you want to be doing in your off ice season. Now, aside from that, I've got loads of webinars coming up and I've done in the past. You can catch old recordings all about off ice fitness. And then, of course, you can check out that off season menu to see what kind of programs I'm offering this year that your team could purchase. Like you don't have to buy one for every single player. You just your team takes it and then you get to get nice and strong. I don't know why this is the signal for strong, but... That's the goal. So yeah, that's my plan. Um, now, my written down answer for that was, was uh, make sure you take a break. So for people who are 
curling a lot this year, make sure you take a break at the end of the year. Give yourself two, three, four weeks of no curling specific stuff. Okay. Then get into some goal setting and performance gap analysis, make a plan, and then follow that plan moving forward because you, it's aligned with your goals and it's aligned with where you want to take yourself in the next few years. So give yourself that break, set a plan, and then execute. That would be my advice for junior curlers in the off season. Okay, let's see. Sweeping technique of how to effectively back a rock, a rock up. Okay, so the term backing a rock up uh, essentially means that I throw a rock and you as the sweeper are not only trying to keep that rock straight, but instead of it curling, it's actually falling. So the sweeping is, I, is, is when you say I want to back it up is you're trying to make it fall. Now, in my opinion, this is really only possible if the ice allows it so straighter ice or ice that has a fall it only works with certain types of release so if you have a little in out release or a very positive release if you have a very soft release you're likely never backing that thing up okay um what else did i have in here so it happens with straight oh the rock oh or the rock is thrown hard it has to be thrown really hard as well i feel like you can't really back a rock up on a guard not really possible now the ice conditions that you're dealing with you're basically sweeping for it to be straight and you're watching it fall backwards instead of curl uh towards the direction that you wanted it to go so the technique would be taking directional brushing and hoping that um your person released it right you got the right type of rocks right type of sheet <laughs> and all those conditions are good so you can't back a rock up if you mess up and you're inside and you dump it, you can't make that rock go backwards unless the ice is uh, conducive to that. It's basically what I'm trying to say. I don't know how you can fix it, but <coughs> I want to get control of my more than control weight shot. So I'm just going to grab a little sip of water. Here we go. I made it further into this than I thought I was going to, to be honest. Um, okay, so let's assume that this question is how to throw higher takeout weights with more control. Number one, practice. Number two, muscular control. So your training, your off-ice training can help you with that. And timing. We come back to why people fall. So often we struggle with upweight shots. We don't have control or accuracy with upweight shots because we've got energy that's not going towards the target. It's going side to side. So it often aligns with our balance and often aligns with our timing. So I would focus a practice on your timing in slower shots and slowly make those takeouts bigger and then practice throwing different takeout weight shots with that timing so really simple we're just looking for time if we're looking for technique and we're looking for strength and we're also looking for spending time practicing so it's not really something that i can tell you how to fix in a game because you're gonna have to do a little trial and error to put yourself in the right spot that's my opinion anyways all right, love this question. I get elbow pain while I'm sweeping. What can I do to stop it? Very, very to the point question. And I love it because this has popped up a couple of times on Instagram between watching the women's Scotties and the men's Briar is, uh, and I've kind of taken a bunch of videos. So hopefully I'll get a chance to kind of, kind of dive into this, but this is our last question before we get to the case study. So what I want to point out first is if I throw a ball, I don't throw a ball from the elbow. I don't throw the ball from the wrist, okay? I, those pieces are a uh, part of it, but I'm gonna throw the ball by, and again, I'm not big on, you know, ball sports. I curled and ran and did yoga and karate. <laughs> okay, so I don't wind up to throw the ball. I'm gonna open up the big chest muscles, get my back muscles, transfer my weight. So I'm gonna have the muscle across the chest that big muscle across the chest, that, that upper body joint, shoulder joint, then my elbow, then my wrist, and then my fingertips. So when I throw a ball, I'm throwing from the big muscles that cross the bigger joints before the smaller joints. So I'm transferring energy, kinetic energy from the ground through the big muscles through to the smaller muscles. Now, point that out and I emphasize it and I underline it and I highlight it because you can throw a ball from the elbow and probably be really effective at it, but you might find that your elbow hurts, okay? So this is where I feel like 
a lot of people without seeing this person move is if we're sweeping with the elbow and we're gonna if you're have a chance to watch me on this youtube you're gonna giggle because i was trying to figure out how people can sweep like a hockey player like you know a face-off i grew up in a hockey family so i recognize that a, 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 that face-off we're playing that really quick stabby okay and i just i don't know how people can sweep by just doing this i feel like here we go there we go. Okay, I'm watching the video and this is hard. So like, I see so many people where the shoulder is locked in, the elbow's high, <laughs> I can't even do it, and they're sweeping with the elbow. Okay, there are a couple of high-end players out there that are getting away with this. And you know what? They're likely incredibly effective. And all for you, all for being effective. However, I'm afraid for your shoulder, I'm afraid for your elbow. To me, it's not efficient because the little guy, the little elbow muscle, like a robot arm, is in charge of creating your power and your speed. And I want the leader to be the big muscles and the big joint across the shoulder and the chest and the back, okay? So in a perfect world, I want that person to actually be sweeping from the shoulder. So that top arm sweeping from the shoulder. Now I'm talking about the top arm right now, I still, I can't fully do it, so hopefully I'll get someone to help me out so I can really appreciate. Oh, there we go, I got it. Okay, oh, it's very internally rotated at the shoulder. Okay, we're getting that sweeping. I don't know, that hurts my shoulder um, personally. And you know what? You can get strong in a effective position that isn't as efficient. Our bodies are smart. We figure out how to compensate. So if you have no pain, you're gonna keep on going. If you're really effective and that's the only way you know how to sweep, you're going to keep on going, but you have elbow pain. I encourage you to try to get the forearm, in my opinion, attached to the brush head. And then that movement is more like a bent over row. So what most people are doing with their elbow up, they're doing more like a tricep extension. And I want a row. I want this movement. And you can see that it's crossing at the big joint before the elbow. So I'm not lifting the elbow up and crossing at the big joint first and then the elbow. Now, if we look at the bottom arm, a lot of time people start to do, I can't even do this either. Okay, hold on, bending and straightening the elbow. Hold on, how do we do it? Hey, they get a lot of their sweeping from bending and straightening the bottom elbow instead of, if you're watching the video here, I'm moving my arm up and down. There's gonna be a tight, there's gonna be movement through our elbows. Our elbows are gonna move, but I want the big muscles, the big joints to be where we're generating our power. It's also a lot easier to get our core involved, okay? And allow us to apply downward pressure. So personal preference, number one, if it works for you, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, <laughs> you're all good. But if you're worried about um, your elbow, uh, energy efficiency, or you're trying to up level your game. Maybe you want to try getting those big chest muscles in. Uh, then I highly recommend it. give it a try. Okay, let's see. Beautiful. All right, now we're moving on to the case study. And what I'm going to do, a couple of things. I'm going to I'm going to switch cameras. Let's see if I can put this on to. Let me see if I can put this on Zoom. I want to make sure that we're ready and I've got my notes. Okay, so case study first. Thank you again. Um, this particular athlete uh, has voluntarily uh, I asked for permission to share their videos. Um, and what I hope that we can do is we're looking at things that are doing really, really well and then looking to optimize a couple of things. Now, this particular athlete originally reached out and this is what they said, I can't seem to get very long sweep strokes, brush strokes. So they want bigger brush strokes without sacrificing a lot of pressure. So it's a, it's, we can apply more pressure when we have shorter brush strokes uh, than those big ones. Because as the brush moves away from your body. So if you think about applying pressure, when I apply pressure down, and as that brush moves away from my body, the amount of pressure I can apply downwards is going to decrease. The amount of pressure I'm applying downwards is highest close to my body and lowest further away. 
When I pull the brush back underneath me, that pressure increases. So it's highest, closest to me, and less further away, okay? Just based off of broom angles and efficiency and all those different things. So this athlete's question is try, they're trying to maintain pressure while getting a longer sweep stroke. And I have a recommendation for them. We're gonna look at a couple of things. They do a really good job. I, uh, I, I highly enjoy their sweeping positioning, but um, okay, let's see if I can figure this out. Let me see if I can stop spotlighting me. Here we go. Bear with me, my friends, bear with me, gallery. Uh-oh, which one is it? Share content, share screen. Oh, beautiful, okay. It is not letting me Shoot. Shooty, shoot, 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 shoot. Okay, so those are uh, watching this on YouTube, you're gonna just wanna like fast forward a little bit because I don't know how to edit before I post on YouTube while I try to figure out how to get this video going. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Photos maybe. Hmm. Okay. All right, we're gonna hit. Here we go, all right, I've got it. So we're gonna have to go uh, video by video, but I, I think this is gonna be really good. So hopefully you can see the screen here and I'll make sure I share the videos if uh, for some reason it doesn't happen. So. Remember that this player is struggling to maintain pressure throughout the brush stroke when they try to make bigger brush strokes, okay? So here we go. Oh, we're gonna get rid of the audio. And actually that, let's do this, so hide some things. Here we go, okay. So I love this. They are clearly incredibly strong. Uh, players and are able to get themselves into a really heavy, big lean. So this is their video of them doing a heavy lean, which is phenomenal. And they're a slide sweeper, right? Let me get rid of the audio here. Okay, we're gonna watch them slowly. Okay, so they're, they're really, they've got a, almost like a 45 degree angle on their brush head. Their hands are incredibly low and they're feeling very calm and confident and strong that they can get their feet really far back. Now, this is one of the things that I always argue with people that feet out from underneath your hips isn't really the goal. Our goal is to use our feet to push our body over the brush. And I wanna point out that difference because I could hold this position and actually still have almost equal pressure between my hands and my feet. So. I like the, th the exercise that like a heavy lean, like they're doing, like they're doing a heavy clean, they're leaning over because I think it gives us an opportunity to practice using our lower body to help us push our body weight over the brush. I think that's a really important piece. I don't think I would change this person sweeping because they're so strong and they've definitely done a lot of work. Uh, again, this is one of those effective versus efficiency pieces they probably could get a little bit more power from their lower body if they weren't in such a heavy lean, but they're probably really effective already. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna touch on that, okay? So I want you to notice that they don't bring their slider foot underneath them very much, but they're using their, their, their kicker foot, their trail foot, they're putting it under and they're using it if they're pushing themselves in the direction of travel. Okay, so they do that a couple of times, okay, which is good. Okay, they're able to apply a lot of pressure. I would be encouraging this person to try to experiment with different brush angles, so not such a steep 45 degree. However, the higher that brush angle, the more vertical it is, it is going to be harder to try to get a really good pull back, okay? Um, 
Okay, so we're, we're heavy leaning. We're recognizing that the further away the brush is from our center of gravity, the less force we're able to apply down. So that's that video one. We're probably not gonna revisit that one. Okay, video two. Okay. So what a couple things I noticed with this is that they're getting a lot of their force from their upper body. Again, incredibly uh, fit athlete, definitely put a lot of hours in and definitely um, really effective at what they're doing. Okay, so they're getting a lot of their power from their upper body, which is great. Again, looking to be even more effective and more efficient, I'd be recommending trying to use the feet every single step. It's not just trying to keep your weight off of your feet, it's using every single step. Okay, now, a couple of things I notice is that the brush, let's see if I can pause this in the right spot, okay? So there's their brush stroke on the way in, there's the brush stroke on the way out. In, maybe let's do a little screen grab comparison here. Oh, can I scrub it slow enough? There we go. And out. Love screen grabs. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Let's pull those up. There's one. Here's two. So hopefully. Okay. So let's make these a little bit bigger. We're going crazy with this. Oh, it's not letting me zoom in a little bit more. Compare the two. I'm gonna get it a little bit bigger. Phenomenal. Okay, so kind of what I'm looking at when we're looking at things like biomechanics, which is the physics of movement, is trying to, is, is looking at uh, force vectors. So what I'm seeing is this player is pushing their body up. I love that, I'm always talking about it. Perfect, great example. However, their brush head is missing out on getting underneath their body more. You want to apply more force, we get an opportunity in curling to literally throw our body weight over. So again, we're talking about this player likely relying a lot on upper body strength and ability to apply force with their arms. And I think they're missing out on using their body weight. The reason is, is because when that brush head goes way out in front of you, we're missing out on some of that vertical force going straight down into the ice. Again, not a biomechanist. These are just my, my I don't know, I hyperfixate on, on movement and see these things in movement. So if this is where their brush head is, underneath their forehead, and then when they do, let's even just draw some lines. Let's get crazy. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's see here. How do you draw lines on this? It would have been faster if I figured that part out. Okay, so if I drew a line from their brush head up, is this gonna draw a line? Yes, phenomenal. And from their brush head up, oops, brush head up. Good, okay, you can see that that space from under their body to in front of them, first of all, they're incredibly far away from the rock. We're, we want to be sweeping as close to the rock as possible. One of the reasons why is if this broom was closer to the rock, they'd be hitting it because they have such a steep broom angle. Uh, 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 not steep, the opposite of steep, flat broom angle. Okay, so a couple of things is I, I'm not surprised this person's losing force because in, in order to make sure they don't fall over with their broom way out away from their body, they have to put more weight on their feet. Okay, so remember that the, the further away the brush is from your body, the least amount of force. And as you pull it in, that, that brush stroke, that brush pressure increases. So my recommendation for this person would be to try to find a sweeping technique that has this be where they push the brush away to and about here be where they pull the brush back to. We can have a longer brush stroke be closer to the rock, so longer brush stroke, closer to the rock, and more force throughout because we're able to spend more time with the brush underneath our body. 
creating that downward force. If I am pushing my body up, then there's going to be a downward force. If I'm pushing my body back, okay, if you're watching my mouse, if I'm pushing my body back, there's less downward force. Okay, so that's my theory with this particular athlete. Again, thinking they're doing a great job, but I, I just feel like they're, they've taken it a little too far in terms of that really big, heavy lean. Okay, we can lean on the brush without having a broom that's like basically touching the ice and fingertips that are touching the ice. Okay, so let's go back to this video. They're doing a much better job, but again, we're seeing that brush get ahead of their head from the side view. Hey, this is a great view. But I think if we can get that brush more underneath them, not saying change their legs, more brush underneath them, it's going to be a little bit more helpful. Okay, especially in terms of their specific quandary of how do I keep the brush pressure high throughout a bigger sweep stroke? We want to keep as much of that sweep stroke underneath your body. So this person likely is going to end up with a little bit of a steeper broom angle, but if it's accomplishing their goals, I think that's a fantastic thing. So let me just double check that I didn't miss anything else. Yes, I think we're going to stick with that. Those are my thoughts. Right now, brush head is being pushed too far out from underneath body, okay? And we're not maximizing that downward force by pushing the broom. I'm not just pushing the broom down, I'm pushing my body up. I'm making sure I don't fall over. So that's kind of my thought with that. The other is that they can start to think about trying to actually use that trail foot to apply even more force in the direction of travel over the brush. Again, I think that's just um, helping to make them a little bit more effective and more efficient in the long run, uh, but doesn't necessarily help them with their main problems. So this has been amazing. Really appreciate the, the opportunity for a question and answer period and a case study. Um, for this particular athlete, I, I do have to say like, what kind of dr drills might I give them? It would be lots of video. I think we need to come back to using video, seeing um, where they're actually sweeping, maybe putting things down on the ice so that you, you're trying to sweep within a certain amount, like you're trying to increase your brush stroke. It doesn't have to be that big, <laughs> okay? We want that, depending on what you're looking for, if you're looking for a, a bigger brush stroke, a harder push stroke, then yeah, we need to start it underneath our body more. Um, and then maybe putting something down on the ice that you're trying to sweep within. Maybe putting something down indicating where your feet are so you can try to recreate that. Um, but yeah, I'd be coming back to that. I think the heavy lean, this person is very confident on the brush. They're going to be able to make those adjustments with that. So that's where I'd be doing, I think, a lot of video analysis for that athlete. We're looking for, one, we're looking for them to look better and look a little bit more effective. And I bet you if they get that brush head underneath them, they're going to be even more out of breath after it. Typically, when it put, makes more effort to sweep, because you're getting your body weight over more, it usually means you're doing a really good job in terms of accomplishing the things that we're looking for. Now, uh, just wanting to point out, we're at the beginning of March. I know it's really early for a lot of teams to start to think about this, but if you or your team is starting to think off-season training, I've got loads of things coming up in the new off-season. This is the 10th summer that I will be offering off-season training for curlers. And I, like, I can't even, I'm not even old enough for that. I don't know how time has flown. It's been super awesome. Um, so there's going to be gear. There's going to be webinars. There's going to be collaborations with the uh, world curling again. There's going to be a book at some point. There's going to be classes. We're running DP VIP all year round. Okay. We're, we're just letting teams in. Uh, now I've got my first team signed on. I'm really excited to get them started. Um, all that information is going to end up in the show notes. So if you at any level of play, are looking for some form of fitness or rehab or curling performance improving program, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm sure I've got something for you, whether it's education or a one-on-one -on -one program. But other than that, thank you for your time and energy. Use the, the, uh, the, the link in the show notes if you've got a question for next year or if you'd love to be a case study. Thank you.